Meeting's going to come to order. Hang on. This hang is on, on. Uh, waiting for Hannah Lee. April 18th, meeting of the Spokane City Council. I'm Lori Kinnear, Council President Pro Tem, and Councilmember Beggs is joining us remotely. <clears throat> and we are going to have Pledge of Allegiance first, so please all rise. And before Ms. Fister reads the roll call, I'm going to have Councilmember Stratton read our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Spokane people. And that these lands were once the major trading center for the Spokanes as they shared this place and welcomed other area tribes through their relations, history, trade, and ceremony. We also want to acknowledge that the lands hold the spirit of the place through its knowledge, culture, and through its original peoples since time immemorial. immemorial. As we take a moment to consider the impacts of colonization, may we also acknowledge the strengths and resiliency of the Spokanes and their relatives. As we work together making decisions that benefit all, may we do so as one heart, one mind, and one spirit. We are grateful to be on the shared lands of the Spokane people and ask for the support of their ancestors and all relations. We ask that you recognize these injustices that forever change the lives of the Spokane people and all of their relatives. We agree to work together to stop all acts of continued injustices towards Native Americans and all of our relatives. It is time for reconciliation. We must act upon the truce and take actions that will create restorative justice for all people. Thank you. Ms. Sister, would you please read the roll call? Council President Biggs? Here. Council President Pro Tem Kinnear? Here. Councilmember Bingle? Here. Councilmember Cathcart? Present. Councilmember Stratton? Here. Councilmember Wilkerson? Present. Let the record reflect that Councilmember Zapone is absent. Thank you. We're going to have two uh, presentations. One, <clears throat> our first one will be administrative report from Spokane Tribe Chair Carol Evans. Is she going to be remote she or she's here? She's right there. Hi, Carol. You want to come up and... Yes, please. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Oh my gosh, you made me cry with the land of my acknowledgement and then I come right after. Um, Ah, Hesahal, Petsia. Good day, my friends and relatives. It's such an honor to be here in front of the city council. I'm just so, so uh, feel blessed to see all of you in person. I'm, you know, so used to the Zoom meetings, and I haven't been um, in front of people for a while. I'm usually behind the camera, sitting in my office, and so just so good to see your your beautiful faces. Um, Tsamasa Thluhi's Quest. Uh, Tsamasa is my Indian name, and it was given to me by my late grandmother, Cecilia Pion Abrahamson, who was a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And she also served on the, the Coeur d'Alene Tribal Council um, way back when, in the 70s, in the late 60s. And then my mother also was the first woman uh, elected to the Spokane Tribal Business Council. So I just really am honored that you um, are having me here today to, to visit with you a little bit and talk with you. And um, it seems so fitting because, um, you know, the 22nd is Earth Day, and um, even the land acknowledgement acknowledges the indigenous people of the world and um, our connection to the land, to the water, the air, and 
is so, um, is so there. We always have it and um, so important. So I think I really am grateful to you for inviting me to spend a little bit of time with you. With me, I also have some of our technical staff because I know we're going to talk about a little bit about fish passage. I have um, Brent Nichols, who's a, uh, Brent, could you raise your hand? He's a director of fisheries for the Spokane tribe. And we also have Connor Georgie, um, who is also back here. And he's our anadromous fish manager. And these two have been very, very important individuals in our efforts to bring back the salmon. And so that's, um, that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about um, today. As you know, um, the, the city of Spokane and the whole area is the homeland of the Spokane people, of my ancestors. We were a salmon people, a river people, and um, we haven't had salmon for um, 110 years, um, a long time, and it was a, a, a tragedy for my ancestors because they sustained off the salmon, and the salmon come all the way up to the falls, and and that's where uh, where my ancestors sustained from. And and so um, today we work really hard to bring back the salmon because my people believe that if you bring back the salmon, we can begin to heal. Um, we can uh, heal. And one of the stories I'd like to share, and this is one that Connor knows real well, we know that salmon can return because we have recently had some salmon return. Back in 2017, we released um, some fish into Shimmikin Creek. And in 2019, one came back. The, the, the little, those 753, um, uh, I call them baby salmon, I forget what they're called scientifically, but they were released and they went down through all of the, the dams on the Columbia River system out to the ocean and one came back in 2019 and her name is in Uts Uchikin and that means she who returns. And so we have a we have a, a picture of her because she made it all the way up the Columbia River system and she was pinged at several, at several of the dams because we put these um, tags in them when we release them, and then we can monitor them going out to the ocean, and then if they come back. So she came back in 2019 and made it through all of the dams up the Columbia River to all the way to Chief Joe. And she was attempting to climb the, climb the ladders there in Cobble Tribe. Um, took her, and um, because of the um, because of the possibility of um, what is it um, a, virus. a virus, they had to they, they could only return the, her flesh to us. So we have her preserved, and she's in our admin building. And uh, you know, she called out to her fellow sisters when she was was taken. And in 2020, three more came back. And we had another one return to, down in Rufus, um, Oregon. A uh, fish collector um, uh, took one of them and returned them. So we have two of them that are um, displayed at the tribe. So we know that salmon can return. Um, we have the evidence that they can. And they come up all the way, you know, beautiful, beautiful um, um, fish that um, can, can survive, you know, the, going all the way out to the ocean and coming back is, is amazing. Um, but uh, with um, the Spokane tribe, we, we have put a lot of effort into fish passage, and we work with the Yukut tribes uh, of, uh, it, that they have an office here in Spokane, Upper Columbia United Tribes, and it consists of five tribes the Spokane, the Colvilles, the Coeur d'Alene, the Kalispell, and the Kootenai. So for several years, we've been working on passage. And in 2019, we had a um, phase one report on passage. And then, in and then we developed a phase two report for implementation of the phase one report. And recently, we've been um, getting um, 
funding to help with the phase, with, with um, introduction and bringing salmon back. And the phase two report is a scientific adaptive approach to um, bringing back the salmon, a 20 year plan of research and studies of bringing back the salmon and the full cost is an estimated 176 million. But recently um, through our efforts of working with the state legislators, we were awarded three million uh, to start the efforts of bringing back the salmon. And so I just wanted to share with you um, what that can help with. Um, the, the three million for Upper Columbia salmon reintroduction was secured through Washington State, uh, the supplemental budget. And through um, the funds that will be received, they'll, they'll be processed through the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the bill language is three million of the salmon recovery account state appropriation for fiscal year 2023 is provided solely for the department to provide grants and coordinate with the tribes of the upper columbia river to reintroduce chinook salmon and so we're currently working with the washington department of fish and wildlife to process those funds and make them available to the yukut tribes and the yukut organization these funds are for use in fiscal year 2023, and the tribe will be using these funds are the tribes, which mainly would be the Colville tribe, the Spokane tribe, and Coeur d'Alene tribe the, in the blocked areas. We would be using these funds to purchase research, research and transport equipment for fa our phase two and to um, contract for design of additional fish rearing facilities in the Upper Columbia to support reintroduction. Um, we will be working to secure additional funds in the next state biennium budget and may be looking for support for this from the city of Spokane later this year. We are also seeking federal funds through the congressional directed spending process and we uh, appreciate that the city of Spokane um, has provided letters of support for these efforts and we really appreciate that you have, um, have uh, understand the need to, to return the salmon. We know that it's not only going to help our people and the other tribes in the area, but it'll help the whole area. Um, we know uh, with experience with other fish that we can build an economy on the fish. And um, that's happened in some cases in Lake Roosevelt. But we know that when we lost the salmon, when the dams were built, we lost over 40% of the salmon in the whole Columbia River Basin area. And just bringing them back and that, that opportunity of bringing back the salmon to the cooler waters will help the whole Columbia River Basin. And so um, that was what I wanted to um, bring to you and thank you for your support of our efforts. And I do, we have both Connor and Brent here if you have any questions that I can't answer about this project, but we really appreciate all of your support of this project and uh, letting you know that it means so much to us because um, we truly believe if we bring back the salmon, our people can heal. So, Shea Uhoy, thank you for listening to, me. listening to me. That's all I have to say for now, but I'm here for any questions you might have. Carol, thanks so much. It's so nice to see you. Do you have questions for Carol, anyone? Okay, well, we well, appreciate darn, the effort. Look at all I got. I, I got know. all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, Lem Lemch, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And thank you, too, as well, for coming. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to have a report from Brown's edition. Mary Lou and Rick, come on up. Thanks so much for coming. And tell us all about the wonderful things happening in Brown's edition. Up at the top there, there's a little arrow. Yep. Okay, 
Okay. Um, my name is Mary Lou Sproul, and I'm here tonight with Rick Biggerstaff, who's our neighborhood chair. Um, let's start with STA. As you know, City Line is coming to Brown's edition. Our latest work has been around the bus shelters. Here are the bus shelters that we had, and this is what we were told we were getting. Yikes. After three to four years of negotiations with STA, this is the design that was settled on. Much better, don't you think? Brown's Watch is a group of volunteers from the neighborhood who go on organized walks through the neighborhood to help keep it clean, safe, and friendly. 2021 was its second year. Now, I'll tell you why we need Brown's Watch. We have people in need who we care about. Abandoned cars are left on our streets. Trash and rotting food is strewn in our park. And increased drug dealing has become a huge problem. Our park has become the center of these problems. In 2021, Brown's Watch volunteers logged 384 hours. They picked up 15, 516 bags of garbage along with help from the Parks Department. That's quite a few truckloads. In our neighborhood, we were also, there were also hundreds of calls from residents. You've heard this story before from us and from other neighborhoods. Brown's Edition is a little different from other neighborhoods, and let me show you why with an example. On September 22nd, an inoperable RV was towed by a pickup truck to the corner of Pacific and Coeur d'Alene. A van came along with it. The occupants proceeded to set up shop. For several days, people kept coming and going, getting their supply of drugs. On September 28th, six days later, this RV was towed away at the expense of the city. Why did it take only six days to get rid of this drug-dealing RV when it has taken up to five months to get rid of other reported vehicles in, in the neighborhood? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I've got only 10 minutes here. Uh, Brown's Edition is a small neighborhood geographically less than one-fifth of a square mile, and 10 acres of that is the park. But it's densely populated with almost 3,000 residents of varying ages, incomes, and lifestyles. About 86% of the households are rented, which is twice the citywide average. Within one block, in either direction of this RV, there are over 130 homeowners. This RV happened to park where we have the greatest density of property owners. Once the residents, the homeowners, at this end of the neighborhood coordinated their efforts to call 311 every day, well, you can imagine how many calls the 311 staff had on their answering machine come Monday morning. This proves that reporting really works. But since most of the residents in Brown's edition are transient renters, they are more likely to just complain and not coordinate, like the homeowners did. Property owners are more likely to coordinate efforts than renters. This is why Brown's, edi Brown's edition is different from many other neighborhoods and why the problems here are amplified. Okay, back to Brown's Watch. Brown's Watch formed partnerships with other organizations. The police department has provided more patrols when we became a hotspot. The park attendant even developed relationships with unhoused residents of the park to help. No parking signs were installed around the park in late October to help mitigate inappropriate parking, and we're hoping this will prove effective this year. Speaking of the park, we're still asking the city to get started on capital projects from our 2015 master plan. For example, our old wooden play structures are unsafe and really need an upgrade. If our park can become a safe and welcoming place, more residents will want to go there to play. We continue to have a good partnership with the Guardian Foundation and Cannon Street Shelter. Someone from the shelter attends almost all of our monthly council meetings. In the last year, the shelter guests spent more than 600 hours conducting daily cleanup walks around the streets surrounding the shelter and, of course, in Brown's addition. 
The shelter continues to provide Kodiak security services throughout the neighborhood to report illegal activities and code violations. We have a good neighbor relationship with Cannon Street Shelter and the Guardians. Tragedy hit our neighborhood in August. It was a difficult night. There were loud arguments going on into the night between the residents and trespassers. A few hours later, a firebomb was set in the stairwell of the building, which prevented the residents from escaping the fire. The apartment building next door then caught fire and was also completely destroyed. While the fire raged, neighbors and non-residents came to help get people out. Two people died, and about 45 others were displaced. The arsonists were not found. The Neighborhood Council made arrangements with Central Adventist Church to set up an account for people to donate to the victims of the fire. Now, the good news is that one of the landlords has already worked with the Historic Preservation Office and the city to rebuild. He and his architect have designed something appropriate for our historic neighborhood, and, are you ready? Here is his new 12-unit apartment building with off-street parking, and we all think this is great. Okay, let's move on to historic preservation. In 2019, Brown's Edition became the first neighborhood to become a local historic district. So here's the scoop from the last year. There were two special valuation projects which give homeowners 10-year tax breaks for significant improvements. There were two facade improvement grants of about $4,000 in matching funds. A garage rebuild was approved after a fire damaged the property. Three historic properties were saved from the wrecking ball and these properties will be renovated. Because Brown's Edition is so densely populated, you can imagine that there are many cars parked on the streets and there are a lot of pedestrians. <clears throat> traffic calming is important and there are many ways to calm the traffic. For the last several years, we have asked for traffic circles at three intersections to slow down the traffic that speeds into the neighborhood from the arterial. So far, we've been given a crosswalk. We'll keep working away at making our streets safe. Hopefully, the new traffic calming procedures will prove fruitful. Ah, but wait, there's <laughs> more. Mike Harbis was one of our very active volunteers who passed away suddenly last year. This year, we honored him by instituting the Mike Harvis Volunteer of the Year Award. And the first award went to Peyton Smith, who organized Brown's Watch and created many of the partnerships we currently enjoy. We conducted two neighborhood cleanups, one in the spring, one in the fall. And this year, we are back to having eight concerts in July and August. Since it's our 25th anniversary, we're doing it up big. Annie Matlow, our concert coordinator, has gotten STCU as our anchor sponsor, and several other businesses have also donated <coughs> large amounts. This year, we will have some name brand groups, so be sure to catch as many of them as you can. Come on down. That's Thursdays, July and August, from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. This presentation would not be complete without a word about Spook Walk. Last Halloween, we did four ghost tours. It was a, a fundraiser for the Friends of Coeur d'Alene Park. This is the night with the smallest group. Now we're looking for a good storyteller to be a second tour guide this year. So, if you're interested, just saying, let's chat. Um, be sure to catch the fun over Halloween weekend this year. <laughs> okay, Brown's Edition relies upon many volunteers to bring us all together. We have about 20 to 30 people attend our monthly council meetings. Here are some of our fearless leaders of the executive council. Okay, that's it for this year's presentation. Do you have any questions? 
That was fabulous. We have a Amazing. question for Mr. Cathcart has a question. Oh, we have a volunteer to do uh, spooky. Oh, you do yeah, have, a, yeah. we have, you have a volunteer? I know where all the ghosts are in Brown's edition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we can plan a second tour then. It'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for the, uh, the update and the presentation. I thought it was really well done. And uh, not, you know, living in Browns or being around Browns uh, as much as you are, it does sound like the folks there are well represented. So thank you for that. My, my question is, I'm wondering in your mind, how much of a difference does having that Kodiak security uh, make to the neighborhood? Actually, Rick is my question answerer. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Rick. Thanks for asking about that. Um, it, it does make a difference. They, they aren't they're there for the Cannon Street shelter, but they chose, and Guardians chose to have them actually patrol through our entire neighborhood. So it's just another, it's just more eyes, it's more presence, and it just sends a message that we care about safety and the safety for everyone. So it has had a significant impact. We're just looking for more, more people in the, in the neighborhood to keep eyes out. Um, they're very good. Then their top priority is to work with people, not to become a negative impact, but actually to be there to, for support. So. They check in with people and help them understand where they can get services. They keep tabs on who they're seeing regularly, et cetera. So it's really been a, a quite a plus. That, that's great. And yeah. it's something we should probably learn from Absolutely. elsewhere in the city yeah. as well. All driven by the Guardians, which has been very good. I'll just say, Rick and Mary Lou, thank you. I'm a Browns. Uh, good work going on there. That crosswalk by the Rosars grocery store. I am a big advocate because you can get killed crossing mm -hmm. to get to the grocery store. Yeah but the STA bus line, the city line, that was great work and a great partnership um, when everybody came to the table to make that happen yeah. for our community. So thank you both for your leadership and I'll see you at Rosars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. And you, you all, you know, you've worked really hard on that bus stop issue. So yeah. it's been a long time coming. Appreciate your hard work and everything else you do. Amazing. We're happy about that. Yeah, yeah. great. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming. All right, next up we have our consent agenda. And as some of you know, we have some changes to our procedures. Our, our council rules change just a bit. And we've put our consent agenda in our 6 o'clock meeting. And what's going to happen is Terry will read the whole thing first. And then we will call on the people that signed up to testify. And you will only get three minutes, or I shouldn't say only, that's a long time if you're well organized, but you'll get three minutes to speak. Uh, if you want to speak uh, from, on more than one item, it's still three minutes. So use your time wisely. And Terry, I'm going to let you go ahead and read the consent. Go, oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. And we do have one thing that's no longer on the agenda, and that is number eight. It's. Um, uh, 0247. So that is no longer on the agenda. That will not be, uh, cannot be part of uh, what you are speaking to. I would also remind you to direct your comments to me, state your name, your city that you live, and uh, Hannah Lee is going to be our, our time guard and a general person that's going to keep me on track too. So uh, pay attention to her as well. Thanks. Go ahead, Terry. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, final three-year value blanket renewal with consolidated supply, Spokane Valley, Washington. For as-needed purchase of service brass and ball valves, estimated annual amount, $225,000, including tax. Number two, contract renewal, one of two with Two Rivers Terminal, LLC, Pasco, Washington, to supply approximately 65,000 gallons of liquid nitrate oxygen. Odor control solution to Riverside Park Water Reclamation Facility at current price of $2.56 per, per gallon to be reviewed quarterly due to volatile market from April 1, 2022 through March 31, 2023, not to exceed $170,000 plus applicable tax. Number three, contract with Power City Electric Incorporated Spokane for DSS pump motor control modifications at the Riverside Park Water Reclamation Facility from March 21, 2022 through December 31, 2022, not to exceed $133,852, including tax. Number four, contract with Willis Towers Watson Insurance Services West Incorporated, Seattle, Washington, for risk management broker services from April 1, 2022 through March 31, 2025, $65,000 per year. Number five, contract amendment with Stuart A. Estes and the law firm of Keating Buckland and McCormick Incorporated. P.S. Seattle, Washington for outside counsel services and advice in the legal matters estate of David Novak et al. versus City of Spokane et al. 
$125,000, total contract amount $374,500. Number six, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library for April 8, 2022. Total $8,984,637.85 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library total $7,854,312.83. Item number seven, there are no city council meeting minutes for this week to, for approval. And number eight has been deferred to April 25, 2022 agenda. Thank you, that was perfect, all right. So we have had, uh, five people signed up to testify. First is Mr. Rick Bocook. Rick, do you wanna come on down? You have three minutes, up to three minutes. Rick Wilcook, Spokane, Washington. Um, I'm looking at this contract amendment regarding, uh, it says the estate of David Novak. One of the biggest issues I have here on this is that this city has attorneys already, and what this looks like to me is that the attorneys that are here are incompetent or they don't know what they're talking about. Why are you trying to get other attorneys from another city on this? Private attorneys. The city already has attorneys being paid by the taxpayer. Now you're gonna go outside the bounds and get private attorneys with taxpayer money. I think that's really wrong, really, really wrong. I mean, <clears throat> there's been so much, um, what do you call it? incompetence with the police department, uh, violating people's rights constantly. And um, the ones that people know about, it's like they just get dismissed like it never happened. And now this stuff's coming up. It's wrong, 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 wrong. Should not have taxpayer money paying for private attorneys. That's all I got to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bocook. Next up is Crystal. Uh, I think her, your last name is Burgett. Thanks, Crystal. A little unprepared, but um, I do agree about um, being careful about taking our tax dollars towards private attorneys. I myself can't even get an attorney, so it's really conflicting to think about the fact that our tax dollars would be going towards something that the city has done. So I'm, I'm against that, and that's all I came to say today. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Next up is Anwar Peace. Welcome, Mr. Peace. Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, uh, Spokane resident. Um, <clears throat> January 7th, 2019, David Novak, who is 35, white male, unarmed, was killed, shot and killed in the back by Officer Brandon Rakin. This shooting was witnessed by multiple officers. One of those officers, Officer Taylor Johnson, who actually pulled a gun on me in the back of my car wash, looking for a white man. But because I wouldn't give my name, he pulled, pulled guns on me and had seven other officers pull their guns on me. Next officer involved in the David Novak case, Officer Chris Johnson, who an hour and 15 minutes after being, having those guns pulled on me, Officer Chris Johnson came to my work to try to get me fired because I wouldn't give my name to these officers even though I was in a work uniform. There's a whole list of other officers um, <clears throat> that are, were witness to this shooting, but the main thing is David Novak was unarmed the whole situation started because he was hitting his truck with a baseball bat and over eight, nine skilled trained officers determined that that baseball bat sound was a shotgun blast in the middle of the night. Even though they could not smell any kind of gunpowder, did not see any kind of flash. And in fact, when he was actually shot, he had dropped the bat, a metal baseball bat. When you drop it, it makes a distinct sound on the ground. He was going back inside of his house, and that's when he was shot in the back. Left to lay in his doorstep 
for hours. Nobody immediately rendered aid to him. In fact, there was good jobs and data boy going around by the officers. Now, I've met Officer Brandon Reagan. In fact, this past January, the three-year anniversary, against the family's wishes, these same attorneys that you guys are now paying more money for showed up to the David's house. Totally freaked out the Novak family. To, took them into a PTS mode. And you know what Brandon Rakin was like? Didn't phase him. Showed no remorse. When we asked him to back away from the situation because people were having hysterics, he didn't care. The lawyers didn't care. This is coming up to trial in June. This city needs to do the right thing and not pay any more private attorneys and settle this case with this family. Because this family deserves justice. Being shot in the back, unarmed, does not deserve private attorneys of over $300,000. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peace. Okay, our last two people uh, withdrawn their names. So, now counsel, any discussion on these consent items? Nothing? We're going to do, uh, do you want to vote on them all at once? Anybody want to take anything off or are we good with the whole thing? Okay, I can vote we're gonna have a voice vote then. Council President, are you with us? Yep, okay. Yep. So all those in favor of passing the consent agenda as is, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed, nay? Great, thanks so much. All right, we're gonna move on to emergency ordinance uh, 36190. Do you wanna read that, Mr. Ms. Sister? Ordinance C36190, Interim Zoning Ordinance Concerning the Siting of Indoor Emergency, shel emergency Shelters, amending Spokane Municipal Code Section 17C.130.100 and Spokane Municipal Code Section 17C.130.110 on an interim basis, setting a public hearing for June 6, 2022, establishing a work program and declaring an emergency, deferred from April 11, 2022 agenda. Thank you. All right, we have five people who signed up for this. First up is Mr. Kevin, looks like Brockbank. Great, thank you, welcome. Three minutes, please state your name and your city. Good evening, Council. I'm Kevin Brockbank, City of Spokane, and I am the president of Spokane Community College, and I'm here to speak in opposition to this emergency ordinance this evening that is designed to support the concept of a homeless shelter at 4320 uh, Trent. Uh, I can tell you that all of us at SCC were concerned, disappointed, and frankly frustrated to learn of this proposed partnership through the local media last week, because at this point, no one at SCC has been contacted, consulted, or communicated with regarding this concept. And I think that's a problem, as uh, yet we know there's been lots of challenges finding an appropriate site for homeless shelter, but as the mayor has expressed some uh, public criteria for site selection, I think there's some major oversights here in placing it where it currently is and some things that have not been vetted very well. So I wanna point a couple of those out. First, the criteria that it's on a bus line. You know, the proximity of the STA Plaza at Spokane Community College certainly would be a resource for the proposed shelter. However, it has to be taken into consideration that the STA Plaza is on leased property from SCC and within the boundaries of daily campus activities. When we created that partnership with STA, we took a lot of time and did a lot of due diligence to address safety and traffic concerns and considerations that we're gonna develop from that and, uh, and in a way that uh, you know, served both parties very well in that. Um, but at this point, there's been no contact from the city on this being a component of the new shelter. It leaves a major impact unaccounted for in this project. The second criteria that's been publicly stated is that, is that it's away from a school or daycare. We are a school and probably the largest school in the Spokane area. Every year we serve anywhere from 13 to 18,000 students at SCC. Granted, not all of them at that site, but the thousands and thousands of students we serve there, within that population, you have to recognize that there's over 700 local high school students that access education at that site um, through the right Running Start program. Those students are 15 to 18 years old. Also a major oversight at SCC is the fact that we currently well, we always have had, um, an early childhood development center where on a daily basis we serve 112 children between the ages of six weeks and five years old. Now, 
we, like I said, we have not been contacted yet. And recent public comments from city leaders about the process for the site and the fact that neighbors have been contacted and discussions have taken place is not accurate. Our college is the largest neighbor in the, with the largest footprint, 130 acres, most public traffic, thousands of people on a, on a typical day, uh, and a site serving local Spokane youth in an educational setting, yet we have not been consulted and not con contacted in any manner. So we're asking you that before considerations of this project move forward any further, we would expect a truly collaborative process that includes Spokane Community College and includes a comprehensive assessment of the impact on the neighborhood, the college, and the adults and youth we serve. We expect to be a part of that major discussion, and we urge you to recognize this oversight, pause your decision making on this site, and adjust the process to, in a way to appropriately include SCC in those discussions while we fully vet this idea. So thank you for your time and consideration of our concerns. Can I ask how, how far is SCC from the proposed site exactly? It has been stated um, in local media that it's half a mile. Um, I will tell you that I don't think that's accurate per Google map, the front site of our Campus is on Green Street. Um, I've, I've looked at it, walked. It's not a half a mile. It's shorter than that. Okay. How long would it take you to walk from the Trent site to uh, Less than SEC? 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. your time. Mr. Corker, next. My name is Steve Corker. I'm the resident of the city of Spokane. I'm speaking in opposition to the shelter as it is proposed. I'm sure there are going to be concerns with any location, but my concern is that it appears that this shelter is going to be a kind of permanent housing situation, that individuals will be uh, there for extended periods of time. Um, I firmly believe that in the case of dealing with the homeless population, it's very important to divide that group into a minimum of four groups, up to eight groups, to separate those that are dealing with alcohol and drug addiction, separate the people who are dealing with mental illness, separate the people that are temporarily experiencing homelessness as a work of medical, loss of income, or loss of job, and then those that are transits. My generation refer to them homos, people that are looking for interim services but are in a kind of a transportation mode. If this center is going to be a clearinghouse station where individuals come in and are separated into specific groups that can be served and be made available of services, then I, I, I guess this site would do. But it, I think it's critically important to not create a shelter environment where you're dealing with all the homeless population in one location. Again, I think there are issues that, that relate to being far away from a lot of the services that these individuals will so desperately need. The fact that the Consortium Care voted almost unanimously against this proposal is an indication that those working professionals that are dealing with homeless, that are dealing with the struggle of trying to find low-income housing, have great concerns about this particular location. It, it deserves further study. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corker. I just want to remind everybody that this particular ordinance that we're considering is about zoning. It's not about a specific shelter. So I would like the people who are testifying to please confine themselves to the zoning piece of this. Thank you. Next, we have Julie Garcia. Welcome, Julie. Good evening, Council. So this is kind of a double-edged sword with the zoning laws for industrial areas because I'm 100% for low barrier shelters and I do know that our areas are limited. I've done analysis of this neighborhood so I'm not gonna talk about this specific shelter but this is, we have to do a better job if we're helping people and that's what we say we're doing we can't put them in situations where it's not helping. We're talking about a low barrier shelter in an industrial area. You have to know the population you serve. Our, you're trying to help. I am with this population every single day. I spend every evening and every night with them. And I can tell you their safety 
is just as much of a concern as it is the safety of the neighborhood. We're talking about people with a lot of trauma, with a lot of barriers, and putting them in a situation that's unsafe is unfair to them. It's unfair because they're going to get the same thing that happens now. We demand accountability for people experiencing homelessness, but we don't dem demand accountability for the city. We don't demand accountability for the service providers. We only demand their accountability. And I'll tell you, putting them in an industrial area where there is zero access to resources in a neighborhood that does not care for them, I'm the person that you're going to call when things go wrong. I'm the person that's going to have to show up and get them out of jail. It's unsafe. And as much as I love the idea of opening up areas for homeless shelters, and I do 100% support that, I do believe that there needs to be better analysis of locations and people who are part of this population or serve this population that help determine those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next up is David. Not sure the last name from the Landlord Association. It's Daniel, oh. by the way. It's okay. Okay. Let's okay, hi. close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Daniel Clemmy. I'm the president of the Landlord Association. I'm also a board member of the COC. I took a tour of this facility, and what it didn't feel like was home. I think people that are experiencing homelessness need safe and stable housing. I agree with what uh, Julie Garcia just mentioned. Um, I don't think people are going to want to go there. It also seemed like it, it's not very sustainable because as far as I can tell, this you guys are going to be voting for six months increments to change the zoning. So if somebody does put um, the shelter up every six months, they're going to be worried about their funding being cut or the zoning changing. I don't think that's right to put that kind of obligation on the shelter provider. Um, we did go on a tour of it. I know a lot of people worked really hard through the city to get this done. I don't think it's ready. <laughs> I really don't. I didn't see any vision. I didn't even see a drawing on a napkin. So I would like a little bit more information as somebody that's trying to help you guys and help our community. It just It's just not ready. And I think that I think you guys need to talk to more people with lived experience about whether they want to go there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next up, we have Tara, and you indicated you might want to testify. So, Tara, are you here? All righty, going, going, gone. Great. All right, council. Um, council discussion. Who's going to go first? I will. All right. Thank you, Council Member Kinnear. So at first blush, I was going to be in support of this ordinance, this emergency zoning changes. But after going a little bit deeper, to me it's part of a three-legged stool about our housing issue and our shelter issue. It's not just the zone. Council has yet to see the proposal for the rental of the space who the operator will be, what the cost of that will be, what the contract is going to be like. So as a council member, I'd like this to come to me as a package deal so I truly know how much money we'll be dealing with. Right now, it's, um, it's not a blank check, but it kind of feels like a blank check because we don't have any numbers to insert. And so then what would that look like? for sustainability. I know a lot of people think, well, we'll just use ARPA funding. Well, part of that can be used, but when that money's gone, then what will the city do? Where will that money come from to keep this shelter open? And if all our money is utilized on this location, where will the resources come for potential other opportunities to meet the needs of the people we're serving? We've all talked about scatter, scatter sites, we have mental health facilities throughout our entire city. I have one myself in Brown's Edition, been there since 1975, have been a good neighbor, and has had no issues. And if we do, it's a small enough group of people that we can manage that. 
but the potential of 200, 250 people being put in a neighborhood at one time will change the neighborhood. And I know the city's made all kind of steps toward to mitigate that, whether it's safety, uh, whether it's aesthetics, but it will not change 200 people living in a site in a community that was not there. So going forward, I'm not supporting the zoning change until I see the total package of what the shelter cost is gonna look like. Go ahead, Council Member Stratton. Thanks. Um, I recognize that this, it, we're talking about um, the simple fact of, cha of um, zoning change. Um, the shelter's another piece, but um, to that end, I am, um, I'm very disappointed that it feels like um, from people I have talked to and um, things I have read that we really didn't, time wasn't taken to talk to those neighbors in that area. Um, you know, they may be, this may be an industrial area, but there are businesses. I've gotten letters from individuals who are not feeling that they have been included, that nobody has, um, you know, asked them to come to the table and share their concerns or even resources. You know, sometimes you get people that will, you know, what can they do to, to help? So I, I think we need to slow this down. I thank the president of the community, or SCC for coming down because I, I think that that's, was the first um, big clue that I had that I'm not the only one that thinks this, you know, that there are other organizations and businesses in the areas. So if we do this, then if, I, if, if I'm correct, this is simply changing the zoning or allowing uh, homeless shelters in these zones, but it's not just for this incident, it could be for any other commercial industrial zone. And I, I, I don't think we're ready for it. I'm not ready for it. Um, I think we need more discussion and I think we really need to step back and start involving the businesses along those areas in those commercial um, industrial areas to weigh in and to be part of the discussion. So I won't be supporting this. Mr. Perkins, can I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. I'd also remind you that James Richmond is on the line too if you have legal questions. Oh, wonderful, thank yeah. you. <clears throat> Would you like to give us a little bit of a rundown of the process that you guys have gone through to um, determine your, why this site you believe is best? Yes, sir. Uh, Johnny Perkins, City Administrator. Thank you, Council Member Bingo. Appreciate the opportunity to provide a few comments. Uh, since last, probably mid-December, we have reached out to at least a half a dozen real estate agents in this community. We have reviewed, analyzed, and assessed almost 100, maybe 92, various locations throughout this city. We've had conversations with other communities, Airway Heights specifically, and each location that we looked at, we were just not able to find a space that would be appropriate to do the things that need to be done. I heard Ms. Garcia, she's absolutely right. You have to have a shelter, because I've done this before in San Diego when I was Deputy Chief Operating Officer, to truly start to support and assist those that need it. And we need to do that. We need to show a lot of compassion in this conversation. But you have to have wraparound services that make a difference. You can't have a facility that is a hotel motel that someone stays there and does not get transitioned out. So the idea is to have a facility that has the mental health capabilities, counselors, the drug addiction support, the job training support, the education support, and the housing support, the veteran support. We looked at, an, like I said, maybe 92, couldn't find anything. We looked at a couple in some neighborhoods where residential housing was right there just didn't work for what we were looking for. We found the site on Trent, and it met a lot of the things that we were looking for, a lot of the criteria. The delay in communication to the business community was due to the fact the building was still under escrow. There were still some concerns with the previous owner prior to the current owner purchasing the property. There were some concerns about a lease apparently they still had, and it became very interesting. Once 
previous owner, not the current owner, but the previous owner understood it was the city and what the potential use would be, all of a sudden things got real interesting because the lease went from a minimal lease to something a lot higher. The requirements were a lot greater all of a sudden in terms of the burden of taxpayers, and we did not want to see that. So there were issues with the current, the previous tenant, which was Berg Solutions, with the prior owner. That was finally worked out. The current owner came in, <coughs> offered a price, they negotiated, took some time because of this lease dispute, took extra time to close the escrow and do a, a few other things, which is one of the reasons our delay in the business community actually occurred. And do we have more work to do there? We absolutely do. Um, in, in, in answer to President Brockton's comment, uh, my office is arranging a meeting with Chancellor Johnson. And uh, are we a little behind the curve on that? Absolutely. And I'm going to own that right now. We, we are. Uh, we've had all the council members tour the facility. We had members of the neighbor, uh, Chief uh, Gary Park Neighborhood Council. We had a meeting last Friday at the Fire Training Academy with approximately 70 businesses uh, in and around and near and even a few miles away. And, and uh, we walked them through what the plan is, and they provided their, their comments. And that's why Mr. Brockton and everyone else's comments are appreciated. We need to continue that engagement as we go forward. But I want to let this council know there has been an extraordinary amount of time by this city administrator. I'm trying to run a city of 230,000 residents, 2,300 employees, and a $1.8 billion budget. And I'm spending 80% of my time on this topic because that's how important it is to this community, to the, the mayor, and to the administration. I know to you all as council members. So Council Member Bingo, we've spent a lot of time on this, thousands of hours. We've looked again at approximately 92 properties. We've talked to a lot of real estate agents in the community that are, that are very versed at what they do. Many of you council members offered some properties and venues, and we've looked, looked, at, looked at all those. And the one that we are proposing that this shelter be cited was the one that met the best criteria we had. There is not one site that is going to be perfect. There just isn't. And so we've, we acknowledge that. And I'll just close with this. We are going to do things to help the businesses out there in terms of making sure that uh, security and safety are the highest priority. I will say I have been telling two businesses, we've been telling businesses two things. One, we want to make sure that it's safe for your employees and your customers. Top priority. Number two, we want to protect your assets. We want to protect your assets. So that's what our plan is as we go forward and we move ahead for this discussion. Safety of employees and customers, <coughs> protection of assets. Thank you, sir. I, I have a couple more questions for you, if you wouldn't mind. So you mentioned that you have come from San Diego. Uh, when you were involved in leadership in San Diego, how did San Diego do in helping uh, to transition people from homelessness into uh, housing? We, we, we set up systems that actually have immediate services within either the shelter itself or within the immediate area. So there was a collaboration from the mental health care community. There was a collaboration from uh, the health care in terms of the, the drug addiction. There were job training programs. Uh, in San Diego, we ran a program called uh, Wheels for Change, where we actually hired those who were in the shelter to, to pick up litter in, in our community. Uh, it was with a company called an uh, organization named the Alpha Project. We probably had 15 of uh, individuals from one of the shelters uh, in, in San Diego that we employed uh, to work on, on our litter crews. I'd love to do the same thing here, is, is find individuals within this particular site that want to join our litter team, even if it's a temp seasonal, to help us with some of the litter control that we're, we're, try we're trying to do. We also had on-site services for veterans, veteran population very big in San Diego, with, uh, with the Navy there, in addition to job training and education. So we had resources uh, as, a, as a product of the community college system in California, very big fan of community college, so having community college there to help people that wanted to kind of look into that direction, uh, as well as the, as the uh, job training uh, programs as well. And in San Diego, other cities around the country, are there shelters that are similar in size that are effective in helping people transition out of homelessness? There are. Uh, the one I mentioned, uh, the Alpha Project, had about maybe two, 250, could get up to th 300, and uh, did a very good job of transitioning people not only into another environment to, to, to uh, uh, enhance themselves in terms of jobs and education, 
but actually help them with housing, getting them into some permanent housing, first time home buyers or first time person in an apartment or, 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 or condo. And that was always one of the goals is to, we wanna keep providing services that are gonna grow individuals uh, out of being on the streets uh, to show that compassion that is absolutely necessary to do this. Not everyone is gonna wanna come to the shelter. We know that. Not everyone is gonna wanna receive the help. But by God, we have an obligation as humans, people, to help those that need the help. And that's what our proposal is attempting to do. And it's not perfect, but we're working as hard as we can. So with all that being said, do you support this change? I do support the change. Uh, in order to continue our process, and we are gonna come forward. Earlier today, I made a commitment, and I'm gonna reiterate it again right now. Next Monday, April 25, a recommended provider will be in front of you for your consideration. That is going to happen. Uh, at that time, we will bring forward what the cost is going to be, uh, because we know that now. I kind of have it in my mind, but I don't have my documents in front of me, so I don't wanna speak uh, uh, without having those facts. And the funding has already been identified, and it's funding that you have already approved in terms of what we're going to use as we kick this, this, this facility off. So that, that is something that we can come forward with uh, on Monday, uh, April 25th, even in a preliminary sense, not to ask for the money yet, but at least to Council Member Wilkerson's question, here's what we're looking at in terms of overall cost, not just for this facility, but remember, we have other facilities in Spokane whose contracts term on June 30. So we will also come forward so you can see how we're going to continue those organization services and the time period for such. And we have identified the funds, again, that you have graciously already approved for us uh, to do that. And so, yes, sir, I believe that this action, I would very much ask uh, as the mayor would for you to please consider this this evening. And, and, and my commitment to you earlier today on the 25th, we will come forward with a recommended provider to be selected for, for your discussion and consideration. And at this point, now that uh, Council Member Wilkerson has uh, made a comment about the funding, very appropriately so, we will make sure we come back with that information as well. Somebody else can go, yeah, okay. I may have a couple Council more Member thoughts. Cathcart, do you? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so the city has, in terms of areas around the site, the city has made commitments for additional security, law enforcement presence, um, mitigation for nearby uh, impacted businesses. Uh, do you have any, any of the more specifics on that at this time, or will that be coming forward later? I'm going to speak at a very high level, Council Member Cathcart, but, but um, when, when, we, when we speak about these things, um, uh, whether it's myself or the mayor and administration, uh, this, is, this is what we believe is the way to go. Now, certainly we can discuss different nuances to it, and we certainly want to do that, and we want to be engaging with the community. We are going to have security 24-7 on the site. We are going to have security 24-7 within a half mile radius of the site. So how that's going to look and what that, that looks like, and it would include uh, the, the community college. We are putting together, and I don't have this number yet, mm -hmm. uh, a fund package to support businesses that may need additional fencing, that may need a few extra, maybe more than a few, security cameras. Uh, we're also working uh, with, with um, the police department and council member Cathcart, you had brought this idea up with some other council members about a neighborhood community policing pilot. We are looking at doing a community neighborhood policing pilot in the Chief Gary neighborhood, along with a couple of others. I uh, can't discuss those yet, but for this project in Chief Gary to have that potential officer officers that are doing some footwork out in the community during the day. And so that will be part of that enhanced security. And in, in your mind, if, if the city council votes down or, or decides not to move forward with this, what, what are the consequences of that? What's, what's gonna be the next steps of finding a, a different site? How long will that take? What, I mean, what are the ramifications of not supporting this or, or not moving forward with this site? There is no other site. I'm just going to be really clear and frank with you all. There's no other site. There just isn't. Uh, I have personally been involved in this since December. I've done this before. There is no other site in Spokane. And if we have to start over, it's going to be another six months. The winter will be here again before we have a shelter because we still need to do some tenant improvements in this building that need to be done. And those are going to take some time given the, um, 
material complications, mm -hmm. as well as subcontractors who are now being working 24 seven and are no longer available in, in, in and they're in short supply actually. So there is no other site that I'm aware of. Maybe there is, you know, I've, I've, I've been in Spokane for a year so far, so there may be others that I'm not aware of, but boy, our staff has really been working hard and, and we've, we've looked at 92. If we don't, if their support isn't here this evening, uh, we're not giving up. We'll, 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 we'll take a couple steps back. We'll have some conversations and we're, we'll, we're gonna bring it for, forward again. This is part of what we need to do because the current zoning does not allow this use. And so if this is the site that's gonna be under consideration, then the use, the zoning does need to be changed in order to allow the particular use. And just one last thing, if, there, if for some reason uh, this decision wasn't made tonight, is there any problems with it being made at the same time as the RFP? There is none, no sir. Uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No. Uh, Council President, did you want to go last or do you want to go next? I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. I think he's trying to mute. Um, I'll, oh. I'll just say, I, it doesn't sound like we have the vote to um, get this enacted because it's going to take five votes. It's an emergency. And um, I support the change, the zoning change, because regardless of what people think about this particular location, this is a zoning ordinance for the entire city, not just this location. And there are several warehouse type properties that could be the right shelter for us, and this would enable us to access those and consider them. So I think it's important to vote for it. I'm going to vote for it, but I'm also hearing that some council members are not ready. So I don't See if it's rejected tonight or if it's deferred tonight that it is a no to uh, increase shelter beds as anyone who's watched this knows I think we need to have far more beds and there is no perfect mm -hmm. place not sure whether this is the perfect place or not the perfect but the best place yet and I was certainly taken aback to hear from the community college that they had not been contacted yet and so there is work to be done but it's not a all or nothing vote tonight on this. And I appreciate everyone who's working to move forward. And if we can move forward together with the business community, the nonprofit community, the people with lived experience, uh, I think we can get there. So I'll be supporting it if we take a vote on it. Thank you. And I'll add my two cents. It's more like five cents. If you this have five is cents, about, I'll go first then. What? If you have five cents, I only have two cents. Okay. So. <laughs> but wait, are, did you want to say more? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So sorry. I'll, I'll let you have the last words on this. So again, Council Member Catcart, thank you for asking that question. If we don't move on this tonight, does that mean it's dead? That does not mean it's dead. My concern again is what's going to come first? We could approve the zoning and we still have no money or we have money, we have no zoning. That's why I'm requesting it as a package. I also have some concerns about the lease. Uh, and so there's just a lot of empty uh, blanks in this whole narrative. Not only do I wanna provide for our homeless and unhoused people, but on the flip side, we have responsibilities to the citizens who are paying taxes too. So, you know, there's an accountability piece uh, that we are held to. And I just kept hearing you say, you know, we're looking into that, we're working on that. Uh, today, we said if it's not in writing, it doesn't count. Uh, that's my world of state. But it also came up here on council. We make a lot of promises. If it's not, you know, in black and white, sometimes that verbal communication or interpretation can get lost in the whole execution of that. So I'm not saying no, I'm saying I need uh, more information as a total package that's what makes the most sense to me. It's like, let's have all three parts of this, the zone, the lease, and the provider all come before us at one time, and then we can go forward from there. And I'm a little slow learner, so I'll need more than one or two days to comb through that whole package, because I'm sure it's gonna be a lot. Thank you, Council Member Kinnear. Okay, thank you. All right, so I, I wanna be very clear that this is about an interim zoning ordinance it's allowing shelters on heavy industrial, which 
it didn't previously allow. And I am just focusing on that. I'm not focusing on the shelter, the kind of shelter, the amount of people who are going to, number of people are going to be in the shelter, just this piece. I think this is the first step. And the next step will be, as Mr. Perkins said, identifying all the other pieces around a shelter. But the zoning is heavy industrial. Anywhere in the city that we have heavy industrial. So it could be the West Plains, it, it could be someplace in Hilliard, it could be this, this location. So we're not, we're not keeping ourselves to a location. We are saying heavy industrial anywhere in the city. Mm -hmm. That is the reason I'm supporting it. The, the details that come later on the shelter space are another matter. But this is about an interim zoning ordinance, that's it. So with that, anything else? Okay, we're good, let's prepare to vote. And council president, aye. He's I vote yes. Okay, so that did not pass. We needed five votes for it to pass, Mr. Perkins. So back to the drawing board. Okay, next we have uh, resolution 0032. Ms. Fister, do you wanna read that? Resolution 2022-32, setting hearing before the City Council for May 23, 2022 for the vacation of 26th Avenue from H Street to Scenic Boulevard and Scenic Boulevard from 25th Avenue to 27th Avenue as requested by Jane Lennertz. Okay, we don't have anybody signed up for this. This is merely um, Eldon, I see you in the back there. Do you have anything to add on this? It's merely a setting a hearing. Did you want to add anything? What? Oh. Well. Good evening. No, the only thing I would add is uh, we probably will try to have a conversation with the applicant sometime before that hearing to see if there's any other avenue we can look at because this is an unusual one we're not recommending vacation of this particular location but it was asked of us to has the applicant come forward to actually talk to us about any other route that we can look at because we really do need to preserve a second access out to assembly in that area so hopefully before that hearing we can have some contact on there and come back with something more than just a no okay. that's all i wanted to add to it so this is just setting the hearing yes all right so Good. it's about a month away, so we'll try to see if we can have further conversation with that applicant ahead of that hearing. Super, thank you. Yeah. Any discussion from council? Just just a quick comment. Eldon, I just it's seven fifteen. You didn't have to be here. I just want to thank you for being here and being such a, a diligent member of the of the team. It's just it's wonderful. So just I just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. That's They're busy talking over there. Council President, do you have any comments? No. All right. Prepare to vote. No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Prepare to vote. All right. And your and I, Council President? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> and you thought this was going to be a boring evening. No. All right. Next up, we have uh, 0033. Do you want to go ahead and read that, Ms. Fister? Resolution 2022-33, directing planning services staff to conduct a sub-area planning process and environmental review in the South Logan area of the Logan neighborhood to facilitate transit-oriented development that leverages investments in the city line, Spokane's first bus rapid transit route with high-density residential development utilizing $250,000 grant funds award from the Transit Oriented Development and Implementation Grant Program. Thank you. This is a great opportunity to either of you wish to speak about it. I just wanna thank um, Marin and Spencer and Carl and everybody who went. We went, we were taken on a walking tour for a couple hours um, in the area so that they could sort of show us their vision for the area um, and tell us a little bit more about the about the project. And I was really appreciative to the staff that they were willing to, uh, you know, hit the pavement and take us out and tell us what they were doing. So to them, I just want to say thank you. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, and uh, it was a great walking tour, but also just what we're going to get out of this is really important. Um, more housing, more, more opportunity for housing. So that's really important. And it's close to transit, so it'll be easy for people to get access. So uh, it's great, 
great thing to be doing, and I'm strongly in support. Mm -hmm. Council discussion. We don't have any um, testimony. Council discussion? Council President, anything? Okay. All right, good. Prepare to vote. Council President? Aye. Great, thank you. All right. Next up is 0034, ballot proposition, supporting ballot proposition. Um, Ms. Sister, I think you're gonna have to read this because we made a change. Do you want me to read it in its entirety? I think we need to. Okay. Um, do we need Give to, Mr. McClatchy, is that a, yes. Okay, I'll put it in here. Resolution number 2022-0034, a resolution of the City of Spokane supporting ballot proposition number one entitled City of Spokane EMS Emergency Medical Services Levy. Whereas the current City of Spokane Emergency Medical Services hereafter EMS levy will expire at the end of December 2022. And whereas emergency medical services are a vital public service and whereas access to quality first response emergency medical care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury. And whereas Spokane Fire Department's EMS providers have traditionally served as the safety net of Spokane's healthcare system. And whereas the city and Spokane Fire Department could not provide the same level of first response emergency medical care to those in need without the funding support of the EMS levy. And whereas the EMS levy has contributed significantly to the provision of EMS, which greatly promotes the health and safety of the citizens of the community. And whereas on February 14, 2022, the City Council for the City of Spokane passed resolution number 2022-15, requesting the Spokane County Auditor to hold a special election providing for the submission of proposition number one to the electors of the City of Spokane on the April 26, 2022 special election, authorizing the city to impose additional regular property tax levies to be used exclusively for EMS emergency medical services for the years 2023 through 2028 in the sum of 50 cents per $1,000 of 22, 2022 assessed value pursuant to ordinance number C36175. And whereas on February 28, 2022, the Spokane County Elections Department provided notice of the ballot title language for the City of Spokane Proposition Number 1 for the April 26, 2022 special election, a copy of which is, is attached to this resolution and is on file in the city clerk's office. And whereas proposition number one is approved by the city council pursuant to resolution number 2022-0015 and as submitted to the Spokane County Elections Department shall appear on the April 26, 2022 special election as the following ballot proposition. Proposition number one, city of Spokane EMS emergency medical services levy. The city of Spokane approved resolution number 2022-15 authorizing a ballot proposition imposing additional regular property tax levies to be used exclusively for EMS emergency medical services for the years 2023 through 2028 and the sum of 50 cents per $1,000 of 2022 assessed value as set forth in ordinance number C36175. Shall the city of Spokane be authorized to impose regular property tax levies in the sum of 50 cents per $1,000 of 2022 assessed valuation for the continued provision of EMS emergency medical services for each year for six consecutive years to be collected in 2023, 2023 through 2028 inclusive, yes or no. Now therefore be it resolved that the Spokane City Council supports the passage of the City of Spokane Proposition Number 1 on the April 26, 2022 special election regarding a ballot proposition imposing additional regular property tax levies to be used exclusively for EMS emergency medical services for the years 2023 through 2028 and the sum of 50 cents per $1,000 of 2022 assessed value. Wow, thank you. Council President, uh, you sponsored this as did Councilmember Cathcart. Do you wanna speak on about it first? I'll speak first and then defer to Councilman Cathcart after that. I just wanted to let people know that this is really important. Uh, most of our uh, Firefighting services now goes to emergency medical services, and we all expect a rapid response if someone in our family is having a medical emergency, um, and it costs millions of dollars a year. We're currently in the hole by several million a year that we're having to figure out how to fund. Uh, this will uh, help that situation. It does cost money. By my estimate, it's about $100 per person uh, per year. Uh, but I think well worth it in terms of saving lives and uh, easing suffering for us. Um, I really support us doing this, and so that's one of the reasons why I co-sponsored it. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilman. 
Yeah, this the EMS levies uh, funds somewhere around 27, 28 percent of our, our firefighters. And uh, we, we certainly have a lot of work to do at the city to improve our, our financial situation in the fire department right now, which a lot of is due to just being understaffed. And so if we've lost even more firefighters, um, obviously the overtime would be even worse, um, but also we would lose, the citizens would lose a significant amount of service. And so uh, it just, it's really important, I think, that we renew this, continue that service, continue that service at its current or better levels, and make sure that we are, you know, protecting our community. So uh, I, I do support uh, this resolution and I do support the ballot measure. Thank you. We don't have anyone signed up. Council comment? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, we we do have a significant deficit when it comes to our, our fire um, budget. Um, this is a significant portion of our fire budget. And for us to continue the level of service, we need this to pass. Um, I would continue to encourage the mayor and uh, the, uh, the fire chief to find ways to bring back the um, still laid off firefighters. Um, and if the barrier is the governor, um, based on what he has set forth, then I would ask the governor to reduce those barriers and allow our very committed, um, some of them as long as 29 years, some of them up to the level of the Italian chief, find ways to allow us to bring these people back because the city of Spokane is suffering in service um, and in cost. And so allow us to bring our firefighters back. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion, Councilmember Wilkerson? Just needed, I support it. Shout out to Fire District 4, Patson and Brown's edition, yay. <laughs> yay, yes, absolutely, all right. Fair to vote. Oh, I made a mistake. Okay. Oh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go to the timeout room. Back <laughs> One more time. One, two, three. Oops. Did I get my okay. hands? All right. And council member? Aye. Council president, sorry. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. I Don't get to do that oh. again. All right, next up is 0035, Ms. Fister. Okay. Would you like me to read this one in full as well? This, was, this one was on file on Tuesday, so okay. Are we I'll okay? just read the title. Okay. Resolution 2022-35, committing the City of Spokane to joining the Federal House American America Initiative to help provide additional tools to eliminate homelessness. Thank you, we have one person signed up. Mr. Corker, would you like to speak for three minutes? Again, Steve Corker, City of Spokane. I'm in very strong support of this resolution. We need to do anything, everything we possibly can to deal with the housing crisis that this city, that this region faces. We have lost between three and 500 single-family homes in the low-income rental market. Seattle lost almost 3,000 over the last year. And I think it was as a result of policies that have discouraged the private sector from its commitment of trying to provide low-income housing, particularly when it relates to families. The reality is we need 14,000 living units in this region now. In the next 10 years, we have to build, find 35,000 low-income housing. And I'm not talking about the population influx that may only increase as a result of what's happening in some of the major cities in the Northwest. 80% of the people who rent in the city of Spokane do not have the financial means in order to buy a home. 80% of half of the rental market, the low income, spend more than 30% of their income, not only just on rent, but on the utilities, that's a part of the housing. If we do not provide the housing, if we do not recognize that the private sector has to be a part of the solution. So this initiative, any programs, anything that contributes to our ability to build housing is absolutely essential. I'm not sure what's happened in the dialogue over the last couple of years, but I know when I was on the city council, we passed the centers and quarters. And one of my biggest disappointments was the lack of initiatives that implemented the goal of providing housing. And if even a portion of that had happened and occurred, I think our crisis would have been minimized. But what's happening with government, at the local and particularly at the state level, is their policies are making it even harder 
for the private sector to be a part of the constructive solution. Any initiative that encourages that has to be a part of. And this initiative will provide information to help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corker. Council discussion. I have a number of questions on this on this program. Uh, we didn't have a briefing session on this, and so um, I've only been able to to read up on it. I haven't been able to ask many people questions on this, and so I am curious to hear what the other council members um, have to say about it. Um, I'm obviously in support of anything that's going to help us get housing done, but I don't know much about this program because we haven't had any sessions on it. So I would ask Mr. McClatchy if he has any information, if he could give us a brief elevator on this Chair Wilson, it was briefed in the urban experience committee on March 14th of this year um, so the ha the house America initiative is a sort of a joint effort between HUD and the US Council interagency Council on homelessness and uh, a number of cities have uh, decided to join up together to get technical assistance and to share best practices and to help all of those cities make locally responsive plans for how they're going to provide more housing units and to get people out of homelessness so uh, I think about, I want to estimate, 35 different cities and counties, maybe more across the uh, country have joined the initiative. So uh, there's no mandates. It is a voluntary request that local jurisdictions create plans that are locally responsive. And, um, and this is a way to share information and make sure that everybody is pulling towards the goal of getting people housed. Go ahead. So uh, just Again, I, I also have a lot of questions. Uh, looking through the list, um, so like I looked up just a couple of them. So Boston, for example, they made a specific commitment to a certain number of houses when they joined the program. Minneapolis just joined two weeks ago, and they did the same thing. Um, you know, we're already midway through April. I think by the time we get some of the upcoming infill policies before us to vote, it's going to be June. If there's any controversy, who knows how long. So we don't have places to build frankly, under our current policies, which makes that hard. And we don't have the money to build with the current revenues that we have. And so I'm just trying to understand. And, and it says we have access to money in this, but we, all, but we already have access to those dollars. So I'm trying to understand what is it that, that we're gaining by joining that we don't have now. And if we have to make a commitment to accomplish something, what is that? How much do we have to accomplish? Because the program ends in December 2022. So that gives us six months, basically, to try and build a bunch of stuff that is probably not going to happen. And I don't want us to join something, and then it just, we're a failure. So I'm trying to just understand kind of all those ins and outs. What is it really that we are going to get? The only thing I've been able to find is it says we'll be able to talk to experts. I think we can talk to experts anytime we want, but who are the experts? What sorts of expertise are they going to bring? I think that once the city joins up, that's going to become apparent, number one. And number two, um, I don't think that this initiative um, creates a hard and fast date in which the city has to build things, right? I think this is a public commitment that the city of Spokane wants to build a locally uh, appropriate plan to build housing units and help people get out of homelessness. I think that's what it is. It is a public commitment to building a plan. Now. I mean, I think it's useful to learn from the experiences of other cities, and I think by getting access to the folks who are joined up in this, that we're, we will get just that. Are we publicly committing to any number of, of units, or is it just, hey, we're going to build more housing? I think this would prompt the city of Spokane to come up with a plan for how many units. The Separate city from our housing action plan? Yeah, I think in concert. I think all of these things work together in mm -hmm. concert towards the goal of more housing units and more people out of homelessness. Mm -hmm. But we are not at this point held to any number. This is a resource tool. That's right. And Council Member Catcart, I know we have people experts, but in my short time when I have dealt with National League of Cities in Association of Washington Cities, when you hear what's going on in other areas on various sizes of cities, we don't know sometimes what we don't know because we're in our own region. and any information that would give us a, a leg up that's being received, I think is the opportunity to take it. I mean, oh. So just so I'm clear, so the only, so the only thing here is we're getting information. We're not saying that we're gonna do anything in particular, pass any policy in particular or anything else. We're just signing up, putting our name on a list and as a result, we're gonna get information, that's it. And resources if we and need them. 
Right, and, the, and uh, there's a pledge that the city of Spokane will come up with a plan with goals that are measurable that will help people see that we are committed to making sure that we're building more units and helping people get out, more people get out of homelessness. It sets a public, um, it sets a public um, aspiration in which the city of Spokane can build a plan that's locally responsive. It's more than, I think it's an expectation, not just an aspiration, wouldn't you say? I think so. Uh, I think you're right. One of the things about sort of announcing what you're going to do, setting a goal, say you're going to run a marathon. You tell people, I'm going to run a marathon. Other people are going to hold you accountable to doing your training and making sure that you accomplish that. And so I think this is a part of that. This is one of those uh, mechanisms for accountability for city leaders across the country mm -hmm. to so, say, we're going to build units and we're going to help people get out of homelessness. Councilmember Stratton, you sponsored this with Councilmember Sapone. Did you want to speak to this? Yeah, I just, I wanted to, one of the things that impressed me with this is that with, um, and we're all seeing it now with all of these American Rescue funds coming in and trying to keep track of um, those funds and how we're going to spend it and what we can spend it on, what we can't. I mean, I think having a, um, a resource that can help us through some of those questions with that money coming in, I think will be very helpful because what we've seen now is a lot of questions when, when we get some of those um, short applications for ARPA funds that it's, well, can we use those dollars for this and do we have to do it this way? And I think to, to have that kind of resource available that we can not only get answers to questions, but see what other cities are doing, I, I think it's worth it. Yeah. But haven't we hired a consultant to do that exact thing, to tell us if ARPA, if our ARPA dollars are compatible with different expenditures? I have no idea. We do, we do have a consultant for things that fall in the gray area that is not directly in the line with the ARPA guidelines. So yes, we do have that. But what I heard was this affiliation because we have not sat down and, and challenged ourselves as to how many housing units we think we can do this aspirational, even with the housing action plan. It's like as a city, what do we think we can do and give ourselves a goal? We don't have one, to my knowledge. And what can we put out there that is reasonable, that we think we can achieve as a city in partnership with this and how we leverage all of our monies, whether it's ARPA or 1590 or 460 or any other funding source that may come along, how do we go forward? So I, this will hold us somewhat accountable to stepping up and making some type of commitment, at least aspirational. I don't know what we have to lose in that by pushing ourselves a little bit because we all talk about it, but nobody said anything like, I think we can build 10 houses this year. Is that enough? Or could we build 600? Or how many uh, apartment units can we build? So anyway, it, it, it's a place to start, and this will give us some support in doing that work. So when, when you say we build, are we, you, do you we, mean the, the city, city of Spokane? The city or how we support developers. That's what I'm saying. So through policies, not, through not policies, just revenues. Yes. Okay. Council, President, do you have anything you would like to say about this? Really? Okay. All right. So... Anything else from the folks here? I, I guess my last question would just be, who are the experts that we get to talk with? Because I'm looking at some of the partners on this program, and there are not cities known for good housing policy. Baltimore, Boston, Governor Newsom, all of California, uh, Chicago, Detroit, LA, Philadelphia, Seattle, San Francisco, Washington, DC. Um, my concern is that if they're the experts that we're talking to, that we could be getting bad advice from bad experts. I have no problem listening to people who know what they're doing, but if they're people who have been doing a lot and just doing a lot badly, I think that, that could be detrimental to the city. And so that's my, that's my concern. I just want those questions answered before I feel comfortable in supporting this. And so do we have an answer as to who those experts are? I think that's what we'll find out when yeah. we meet with HUD and the U.S. See, I have a real problem Council with sign it and then find out. I got a real problem with that. But if you that. have HUD, we have HUD at the top of the list mm -hmm. that that's who we start with. Mm -hmm. And we go through the process with, I mean, I'm looking at it, at USICH, what's that? The United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. And um, other federal agencies, which are different than the cities that are participating. That's what I look at, that... Mm -hmm to have that pick up the phone and call somebody from HUD that can walk us through something or somebody um, from HUD that's working on homelessness, that can be a really big, big 
assistance to us, I think. Go ahead, Council Member Wilkins. My last comment, we don't have to take their advice. I mean, we are soliciting it, they can have input, but we have the say at the end yes. if we use that advice or not. So we still have control. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, again, back to this question, because you say it's an aspiration, you clarified and said it's an expectation. And so I don't want to be committing to an expectation that we, we do something from this group. And so mm -hmm. if it's advice that we can get and reject, sure. But I just want to make sure that we can reject that advice if it's bad advice. Well, you know what? An expectation is that we're going to, we're going to task ourselves with building and not the city, but this, the bigger entity city, building so many homes or building so many residents for people. That is, that my, when I say expectation, I mean, it's semantics. It is aspirational as well. Mm -hmm. But I want something like, we're actually gonna actually do something, mm -hmm. not just talk. We've been talking a long time, and now it's time to actually do something. Well, I, I will say I greatly respect Mr. Corker, and uh, his advice there, I think, is it's going to sway my vote. Um, if it's truly something that we can reject and we don't have to commit to anything, then um, I can support this tonight. Okay. Anybody else? Comments? All right. Prepare to vote. There we go. Council President? Oh, Aye. <laughs> I accidentally hit your vote button. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> This is, you know what, we're having a great time. Sorry you're not here. <laughs> All righty. Let's go on. You know, Eldon's still here. He's sitting in the back. Uh, do you want to talk about 36001? Terry will read it first. Okay. Ordinance C36001, vacating the alley border by Riverside Avenue, Sprague Avenue, Helena Street, and Medelia Street as requested by Calistar Holdings Incorporated. First reading held January 4, 2021. Yeah, the applicant on this one has fulfilled all the uh, conditions we had of the vacation. So we're ready for the final reading. They paid us the money, they did the closure work, and they actually established the easements. So we're just here for the final reading of that vacation. Be happy to answer any questions about it. Any questions for Eldon? Eldon, thanks. And thanks again for staying. Sure. It's you really like us a lot and you don't want to go home. <laughs> okay. Uh, comments from council? Comments from Council President? No. All right. Prepare to vote. Great. Thank you. And Council President, you're an aye? All right. Thank aye. you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Our last ordinance is um, actually been deferred to April. 24th. No, two weeks. May 2nd. 2nd. All right. So we have some open forum people, quite a few. And first one on my list is Mia. And again, three minutes. Mia, are you here? Come on down. State your name and what city you live in. Hannah Lee's gonna be doing the time. Good evening, Council. My name is Mia Gray, and I am a lifelong Spokane resident. I was born and raised here. And my hope to share with you all, an honored guest, is my love for this city and my hope for it as well. As someone who was born and raised, I attended multiple schools here. I attended Lewis and Clark, Shadle Park. I went to Shaw Middle School. I also attended a private school as well. And through all of these experiences, I garnered perspective on our education systems, on our teachers, on really the roots of our society and how it grows. Because we start as these seeds, we start as these beautiful seeds in our community, and the policies, the uh, procedures, the systems water us. I believe that our schools and our leaders provide the soil that nourishes us. It grows our roots and sometimes they grow pure and sometimes not so much. <laughs> and I think a lot of what we're seeing in society right now is roots that, that have been hurt. They've been traumatized. They've been in pain. And I believe a lot of our homeless crisis, you know, if you want to call it that, it's hurting people. It's hurting individuals. It's people that have experienced something that has brought them to this place of desperation and hopelessness. 
I've heard Spokane referred to as the city of promise, and it is my hope that we will return to that or continue to take up that mantle and bring it forth. I believe that we will do this through genuineness of heart, but also in simplicity. My intention to come here was to learn and absorb because I do, I do still consider myself as a seed in this community, although I am 26. <laughs> but I believe that the learning never stops. And so I wanted to come here and just absorb. And what I hear is, I do hear an undercurrent of longing to be heard, longing for communication, longing for genuineness and consideration. And I believe that we are on, we're on a good path. I want to share a verse that spoke very loudly to me, and it's Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I believe it's important in this society to consider the least of these, those who are hurting and who are desperate, who have nothing. And I think it's important to consider those of us who have a lot, who have an abundance and who have been blessed. I myself am somebody who was born in Spokane and I consider it to be an abundance. I went to good schools, I had teachers who cared for me, I had a father who poured love into me. So as a citizen of Spokane, I've taken it upon myself to learn more about the people, to learn more about the least of these. I've gone to Camp Hope, which is the homeless encampment that is growing on Thornfrey. I've gone there not to do outreach or ministry or be anything other than Mia, I live here in Spokane. Mia, or three minutes are up. So thank you very much for coming down. Appreciate it. Please visit us again. I thank will. you. Thank you. Next up, we have Sunshine, and I can't read the last name. Wiggins. Come on down. You have three minutes. Okay. Tell us your name and where you live. I'm Sunshine Wigan, and I'm from Santa Cruz, California. We came up here um, 1986, so. But uh, I came here because I'm gonna pass away, and I wanted to give my homeless statement. My, uh, I'm sorry. But um, I came here to give you guys my homeless impact statement of 29 years of homelessness in Spokane. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm dying at any moment. Where, we, where you invest your love, you invest your life. Hello, people. People compare me to a fainting goat. I tell them, get it right, I'm a fainting Martha, <laughs> as a joke. I play it off good. So if I faint, please, I apologize. Also, domestic violence was at the start of my life as my mom put me in a dresser drawer on a pillow with blankets for a crib for the first three months of my life as we fled Spokane to California living in a car after I had brain surgery at a week old. My mother took my hearing by beating my head into a wall. She was my first domestic of violence abuse. My domestic violence abuse stopped permanently when a guy gave me these glasses three years ago. Okay, so I'm going blind and deaf. I can barely hear how loud my tones are coming out of my mouth. I promise it's not me yelling. Have patience with me, please. Also, my lungs are very damaged from sleeping outside permanently. So, I have a hard time breathing while I speak. I work five jobs, and uh, I'm raising my friend's son, who's severely mentally ill. My three kids are mentally ill also. Um, she passed away her heart, transplant did not take. I'm 41 years old, and I beg you guys not to hesitate to save us. I can't express that enough. Here's my homeless impact statement. 
I have 12 digestive tract problems from poor food, gleanings as some would call it. My throat no longer stays open on its own because of my GERD. I have crippling arthritis, osteo in every joint. I'm losing my bone mass. I have venous inconsistency. I have already had two heat strokes this year. Whenever it hits 60 degrees, I end up in the hospital with a heat stroke. My heart doctor said, all homeless sent to him have it. This venous inconsistency, 28% of homeless. Sunshine, we're at three minutes. Do you wanna give the rest of that statement to Terry and she will make sure that we get a copy? Can I please? We would have to give everybody extra time. And if we could read that, I think it'd be more powerful. If, if who? If you give that to Terry, then she'll give that a copy to the rest of us so that we can read it ourselves. It would be more powerful if I can look at it, read it, reread it. If you could do that, that would be really special. It was my dying wish to come here and say this to you guys and face we, to face. Yes, and we've heard you. We appreciate this. Council, Council President, President, I... Do you, would, would you like I, to hear the whole thing? Yeah, I, you, I, I'd move to suspend the rules to allow her to finish. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you for your mercy. <laughs> Twenty-eight percent of homeless have this. When it is hot, my veins get too big and expand, and my blood pressure rockets, and I pass out. When it's cold, it constricts the stop and stops the blood flow, and I pass out. My blood stops flowing randomly, affecting my brain, my heart, and my lungs. I also have four problems with my heart from being in the elements. I have. Um, it attacks my muscles. My doctor said it's one of the most painful things you can have, and there is no cure. And uh, I've had so many severe nervous breakdowns. I no longer have nervous breakdowns. I have neuro breakdowns. This completely changes your chemical makeup in your body, and I no longer have chemicals like the average Joe. Tylenol is like morphine and Benadryl is like a upper. The doctor says, I have a new chemistry and will never react to chemicals the same again. I'm now allergic to 42 medicines, 109 things total. And antibiotic resistant, I control the anaphylactic reactions with Benadryl and EpiPens. Also, it completely changed the routing of my neurotransmitters. I was paralyzed on the side of my body each time and had to relearn to walk and talk. People don't live through the third one normally. I'm on my fourth. The body tries to shut down everything, like rebooting you, even your organs. So back to the venous inconsistency. If we don't find me a heart or water pill, I won't live. We have one left to try before I know if I need hospice. Either way, I'm gonna die from one of the health problems that I have. So, th when the strokes and the heart attacks stop, if I'm allergic, start, if I'm allergic to this pill, I'm gonna pass away. Why did we debate a warming or a cooling shelter? This was preventable with a place to go. I paid the price for this debate. 29 years of chronic homelessness off and on due to my mom standing in court and saying I don't want her. I was 13 that year in 1993. The crosswalk shelter directors are my mom. Now I'm dying from long-term effects of being in the elements. I bought my spot at Holy Cross Cemetery two weeks ago by the unclaimed homeless and my grandma. I was taught we can fix this problem together. I support these mini houses being put in place as a stepping stone to low income housing 
I believe it will prevent what happened to me and also lessen the situations of severe stress that led to domestic violence situations like these glasses. <laughs> it also gives them a sense of being in purpose. It gives them a chance to stabilize their mental and physical health. These houses could be the difference between life or death for them and give them a fighting chance to survive. Let's not leave them in the elements, then show up to their memorial. Not being given the right to a warming shelter or cooling shelter is like domestic violence without an advocate. Please give my adult children the opportunity to end, not end up like me with hands and feet so sickly they turn blue and purple and eventually will be amputated. Once they are black and movement no longer turns them pink when I wake up, we will remove them. My son is in Camp Hope. I bought an apartment six weeks ago and I kept falling down the stairs I'm in my car working five jobs and raising my friend's kid. My other mentally ill kids are lucky enough to be successful. And I just beg you guys, please don't do this to us again this winter. Thank you for listening to me. Sunshine, thank you. I appreciate it so much. And we know how hard it was for you to say all that. Please take care of yourself. We'll do our very best. And also, if you would like, you can still give that to Miss Fister, and we can continue to digest your story. Thank you. Okay, Rick Bocook, are you still here? Three minutes, please. Rick Boca, Spokane. Um, I'm going to talk about the homeless problems here, the tent city, the shelters. But when the city administrator got up here and started talking about fences and security, that was really disturbing to me. Not that he's not thinking about safety and protection, but I think about, darn, you know, in the out of these other shelters, they never had that privilege of having the fences and security like that. Um, but I'm, think, I'm thinking about this stuff. I says, so you got the tent city over there, and it's got a good number of people, and it's symbolic to me. The symbolism of it is it shows you that all of the stories you hear from the administration, that we have all these shelter beds, it showed you they didn't. That's what the symbolism of the tent city is. shows you that you didn't have them. Um, and I think about, okay, so you're gonna come up with a shelter, but is the shelter gonna be biased? Is it gonna forbid couples? Do the couples have to be married? I think about that. You know, and, and, and if a person has a different sexual preference, are they gonna be rejected too? And then there's the uh, screening of the level two and level three sex offenders. See, the youth out here, one of, then they don't talk to you, but they talk to people like me, and they talk to other people. One of the problems they have about going to the shelters is the predators there. One of the problems I have about the predators is we have this sex offender database, but they won't let you share it. See, when, when I, in ten, over 10 years ago, they used to put their pictures up on the wall. These are people that are labeled. They, are, they, they have a, a sickness that they're never healed, they're not supposed to be around children, yet they're in the shelters, and you got these teenagers, these people in there, they don't wanna be around them. Is that gonna be addressed? Is the couple thing gonna be addressed? Or is it gonna be like what our administrator says, is it gonna be like a compound? The way he described this shelter, if there was gonna be a shelter out there in an industrial area, the way he described that, it's gonna have fences, it's gonna have the police, it's gonna have all this security. 
how are you going to ever have anybody go to that shelter? It's going to scare them worse than being out there in the, the city in a tent or on a sleeping bag. You, you, I think that you should look at the tent cities and you should be talking to people. Why are they successful? Why is this tent city being successful and the shelters aren't? I think that's not addressed. Why do people choose not to go to the shelters? That's not addressed. Those questions are not asked enough. They need to be asked. Why is this one working and the other ones aren't? That's what needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Next up is Alexis. Welcome, Alexis. Can you pronounce your last name for me, please? I'm Alexis Galloway Tanasket. Thank you. Go ahead. I am Alexis Galloway Tanasket, a descendant of Chief Joseph Tanasket, Secretary of the MAC Movement, living on Spokane land. I found a few programs that are currently active in another larger city, which are having measurable positive outcomes and wanted to share this information with you. Quote, the city has boosted its program of community safety ambassadors in partnership with a nonprofit, people who hit the streets to clean up garbage and deter drug dealing. And the city has greatly expanded distribution of Narcan, a life-saving opioid reversal drug and easy to use nasal spray kits. But the biggest developments launched by the mayor and city le leaders during the pandemic are street crisis response and specialized overdose response teams made up of specially trained and organized paramedics and clinicians from the fire and health departments. There are some modest signs that the city's overall efforts on overdoses are paying off. Preliminary data for 2021 show that accidental overdose deaths in 2021 were down 7% according to the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. That marks the first overdose death decline in the city since 2018, following years of an upward trend." End quote. This method also relieves local police of many low-level calls, which other professionals are more equipped to handle anyway. Police simply are not trained adequately to be main responders pertaining to substance abuse disorder, mental health, and homelessness. Poverty is a systemic flaw and can be mitigated with organization, creativity, and compassion. Criminalizing poverty by utilizing SPD as the primary contact for people experiencing these issues is clearly not effective. I would like to thank our neighbors and friends who are unhoused who have shown up to City Hall over the past few years in your courage of sharing your direct lived experiences with me, you've opened my eyes to the reality of our community that many are too insulated by privilege to see. You've helped me unlearn many biases and open my heart and mind to be able to fully hear your voice and to feel the complexity of each individual's situation. You allowed me to be present to the burdens of your suffering, even though you've been given many reasons not to trust. Please keep surviving, my friends. Your life is sacred and deserving of our best effort. After all, any of us could end up in your position with unfortunate circumstances. Whether it would take a month or a year or five years, any of us could find ourselves just as vulnerable, just as invisible, just as harshly judged. My greatest dream for our community is that we can figure out how to make decisions from this place, which values life and inclusiveness above all other motivations and agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Next up, Jason Green. Welcome, Jason. Three minutes, please. Good evening, City Council. Jason Green, citizen of Spokane's the city. Um, I'm going to jump around. I'm going to apologize right now. I'm going to jump around a little bit just because a few things have popped up today. One, I really hope we have more citizens in this community like Mia, who spoke a little while ago. Um, it's great to see the youth out. I'm older, much, much older than her, so I'll call 26 the youth. Um, but secondly, since uh, City Administrator Perkins made some comments. He talked about fencing, security cameras, which I guess we would also have to check if the city pays for the security cameras. Do those make public, 
Do those make those cameras public and therefore I can now request the feed off of those security cameras? Just something to think about. Um, but then security, police, inside the facility, surrounding the facility, uh, for this new homeless shelter, some of the neighbors have also asked for razor wire fencing to protect their assets um, from the homeless community. What we're really defining here, people, is a prison. That's what we're defining. We are saying we're going to put up a bunch of fence. We're going to have lots of police. Oh, and by the way, Mr. Perkins comes from San Diego, where they literally have inmates running their homeless shelter. So yes, he wants to define it as a prison. That's what he wants to create. We have a 30,000 square foot building to pack 200 people in. Now, what do we know about a huge facility that has a whole bunch of people? Let me read you a quote from 2018. Rob McCann, CEO of Catholic Charities. So 2018, uh, 2017, HOC used to hold 109 people. 2018, they boosted their, their ability and they, they really pushed it up. They got up over 300 people in that facility. <coughs> That's also when they announced that they're going to cut their, their population in half. Here's Mr. McCann's quote. The staff became quickly overwhelmed, but also our block. Our neighbors who are business owners on the block have been overwhelmed by just the number of people. How many times do we need to repeat history? Do you think putting 300 people on Sprague is going to be any different than putting 300 people on Pacific Avenue and Brown. Go, go talk to Mary Hill Winery and see what they think about a 300-person facility. I can guarantee they don't like it. You know, we're, we're going to severely impact any community that we put out there. We have to be looking at a collective plan. Um, I'll say, you know, and, and our, our system is very fragile right now. Truth Ministry, CityGate, Jules Helping Hands, all have been covering the city's butt for years. None of them are getting really funding from the city. Heck, I just wrote another $1,250 check for porta potties because you all won't even pay for porta potties at Camp Hope. So, like, these groups are all working on community donations, and groups like Hope House are having to ask you for more money so they don't shut their doors. A, a collaborative agreement will help stabilize the whole system. Thanks so much. Appreciate you coming down. Right. We have Ken. Looks like Carrie. Welcome. Thank you, City Council. For Three minutes, there. please. My name is Ken Crary, resident of Spokane. So as an administrator was sitting here talking just a little bit ago, he had a lot of words like, we're talking about it, um, planning it, it could be. Um, I hear that all the time. You know, the city's got a five-year plan. We're on the second five-year plan, I think it is. Maybe even a third one now. It's not working. The, the five-year plans don't work. It's because the administrator doesn't know what they're doing. They use a lot of words like, we plan on, we can, or we might. The fact is, the ball's in your guys' court. There's alternatives. That's all I have. Thank you, Ken. Julie Garcia. I'm going to leave this for you guys when I'm done. This is a story about a man named Million Dollar Murray. Million Dollar Murray was a homeless individual in the city of Reno that was homeless for 10 years. In that 10 years, he costed the city of Reno over a million dollars because they refused to house him, because they didn't have an adequate place for him to exist. The taxpayers funded $1 million. We talk a lot about accountability here. We really do, and I understand it. There should be accountability for people experiencing homelessness, for their behaviors, for their addiction, for anything. Where's the accountability here? Where's the accountability to the taxpayers for this? And every other member of this community that's experiencing homelessness, there's 361 people at Camp Hope today. 361. What, where's the accountability for what we do for them? A prison in Hilliard isn't the answer. They need help. 
They need assistance. They need you guys to talk to them. What's the end result? That's my, that's my confusion here, is what's the end result for the city? We talk a lot about businesses and accountability and all these things. In business, there's a desired outcome. We don't have a desired outcome here because we keep doing the same things that we know don't work. We keep addressing the problem the same, and I just wanna share a little bit about an economic model. I study economic models because I study homelessness, and I need to know where they're going and how it works. The economic model for the United States is for the next three years, homelessness will increase 49%. In 2025, for this county of Spokane, that number added today I found was 37,651 people experiencing homelessness. Our five-year plan ain't gonna do it. Million Dollar Murray, that's what's happening here. We need to address these situations with best practices, with desired outcomes, because I'm disappointed in my city simply for the fact that I don't know what you guys want anymore. I don't know what we're supposed to do. We're doing our part, all of us. And every time we do our part, it's not right. We try something different. This is my second five-year plan with you guys. I've been part of five-year plans for 10 years now, and we still have no answers. I think that maybe you guys are asking the right questions, but you're asking the wrong people because not one of you guys not one of the people planning this has showed up to Camp Hope and asked 361 of our citizens what they would like, how we can help them, what would be the best for their. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Appreciate it. Laura M. My name is Laura, and I'm a citizen of Spokane. Um, when I heard about what was going to be going on on Trent, I did a little bit of legwork, and um, I work in the Department of Corrections. And so when he was when he was bringing up the fences and everything, that's what it reminded me of. So you guys were talking about how far things were. So literally, you guys, the building is feet from another business. It's a seven-minute walk to SCC. It's four blocks to a residential neighborhood, one and a half miles to a daycare one mile and seven blocks till elementary school. There's no medical facilities. The closest one is Sacred Heart. There's um, very limited patrol by the police because of it being on the outskirts of the city, it's more focused on the inside in the city. You're gonna have, um, it's four blocks from the fairgrounds and there's absolutely no assistance out facilities out there. So you guys have the Browns building, which is by the Union Gospel Mission. It's been vacant for a while, and I'm just, I'm just befuddled. You've got at Brown's building, you're, it's close to the unemployment office, it's close to the bus line, it's close to the Mount Spokane Mental Health. You guys are close to resources. You have the, um, the Union Gospel Mission out there as a support system. You have Spokane, um, the, um, the um, Wazoo School of Medicine. The police department has a faster response. And there's no gates around, there's no prisons, there's no bars, it's got a wide area, it's close where people can be outside. If they're on Trent, they can't be outside because you're gonna have everybody freaking out because you have homeless people around. The people who live in that area are no longer gonna feel safe. And the, the people who are homeless aren't gonna feel safe because they're always gonna be watching over their back wondering what's gonna happen if they do something wrong. And I totally agree with what Julie was saying. This has just been, this whole situation has just been flat out ridiculous. I mean, I work with, with DOC and I see the inmates coming in. They're coming in, a lot of them are homeless and they're coming in because they have three meals a day and they have some place to stay that's safe. So I just, I'm just, I'm just befuddled. I just don't understand the, the, the thinking or the process with y'all. And I know it's, it's, this has been an ongoing issue so I'm not saying I'm just saying the city of Spokane, just, they just haven't got a clue. And having somebody come up from California and telling us how to run our city, I think that's, that's ridiculous. You need to talk to the residents of Spokane before talking to somebody from out of state. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next up is Mark, um, can't pronounce the last name, but you know who you are, good. <laughs> 
Can you pronounce it for us, please? Um, Mark Karchner. Thank you. So, good evening, Council. Um, I'm actually I'm humbled by all the decisions you guys have to make. I'm it's overwhelming. Um, thank you for listening to us. I own a 10,000 square foot building in downtown. I'm a business owner in downtown. We remodeled it in 2018, put on the historical registry. I love Spokane. Um, I'm also on the board of directors with Jules Helping Hands, and I'm here to kind of talk about her proposal for Hope Village. I became involved in Spok uh, homelessness uh, a while back because a friend told me there were solutions, and I was really surprised because I, you see it all around. Um, there are cities in our country that have obtained functional zero. There's countries that have obtained functional zero. Functional zero is when you have less people coming into homelessness and going out. And I've heard that Spokane is near functional zero for families, which is amazing. Um, there are solutions, there's hope. Once I became involved, I tried to talk to the most knowledgeable people I know. I talked to Chris Patterson, I talked to Joe Ayer, um, I talked with Ariana Anderson, I talked with Julie Garcia, and just found universal agreement on everybody wants the same thing. And I think that what everyone agrees, the biggest challenge is the low barrier area, and you, I think you know this. Um, so I'm here to ask you to consider the, consider the proposed solution called Hope Village that collabor collaborates with many providers um, and is a proven solution. I was here last week and the League of Women Voters talked about the three things they wanted. They've talked about it for three years. Um, I believe Hope Village gives identity and dignity and I think it's the best step forward. Accountability, um, I know Family Promise has a 58% graduation rate from homelessness. People that walk into their facility, they have a over a 90% graduation rate in their small homes. UGM has a 4% graduation rate. Uh, Cannon Shelter has a 0.4% graduation rate. We need accountability. We need to look at what brings us out of homelessness. Not everybody can be out of homelessness, but um, we need accountability because it, and it, uh, and it improves results and lifts everybody. Um, I hope as, I hope Spokane could be a forerunner in understanding the complexities surrounding and experiencing homelessness and be a leader in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next up is Gina Cook. She's still here. Gina. Okay, going, going, gone. Terry Shanahan. Terry. Okay, people got tired of us. Christian McKinney? They all left at once. They went to a party. Okay. Uh, Steve Corker's still here. I'll uh, let you all start. I've been spending this evening trying to put myself in your heads, and I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. One, think about the village. I was raised in poverty, and nobody hated us because we were poor. We lived in Walla Walla. The Children's Hospital saved my life. A great university gave me a scholarship that changed my life. The Boy Scouts, the church gave me values. The village was there, and it's gonna take more than government. Mm -hmm. It's gonna take the community. And the attitude we have about the poor and about poverty. I spent the last two years trying to save housing for a thousand people, working with the tenants union, putting out fires, and not really spending the time dealing with the cause. And it's calling on the village to help you, to make a difference. And that mindset that the poor aren't our enemy, there are all sorts of reasons for things that happen, but you can make a difference in their lives. The other thing I want you to think about is the community what cities are. Cities are where the people are. Cities are dense. I've been trying to get apartments up in Five Mile, not in my neighborhood. If you're going to live in a city, you're going to have to deal with density and with the poor, because that's where they're going to come. They're going to come to cities. where they. And if we don't change our attitude about the poor, if we don't treat, take away the humanity, we can never get our job done. And while the burden 
seems to fall in government. No, it's government is only a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and so call on that community. I'm a living example of how a difference can be made. And a part of my commitment is to pay back, and I can't thank the people that helped me, but every one of them told me, spend your life doing what I did for you. And, and that's the opportunity you have. Welcome it. I get, I get disappointed all the time facing the challenges, but I've never been discouraged. This is the best place in the world to live. And we have the resources to make a difference, but sometimes we have to get kicked in the butt before we make, have the courage to move forward. This is my home for the last 50 years. My children are here, my grandchildren are here. And, and we can make a difference, we can change it, but it's gonna take time. I was told by the Youngstown Howell people, it's going to take 25 years to solve the housing crisis. You sleep nights because you get two steps forward, one step back. I've got to, I wish I could jump in your shoes. I wish I could have 40 years to deal with it instead of being 81. Welcome the opportunity. Welcome the challenge. You all can make a difference, every one of you. And I thank God you're here to make that difference. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I always enjoy your inspirational speeches. And in your past life, you were a pastor, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> OK, Anwar Peace, you're our last open forum person. Please come up. Good evening. My name is Anwar Peace, a Spokane resident and a 22-year police accountability expert. Recently, I found myself in some high-level meetings with criminal justice officials, which those officials have brought up the ingrained dysfunction within the Spokane Police Department they have seen from afar and asked my take on the matter. First, first I thought this was a one-off when this happened to me in February when I met members of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. Commissioners said that the first batch of officers in the state to have decertification hearings will be a large number of Spokane officers. So that was very eye-opening for me. Another eye-opening meeting in this regard happened to me in March when I met twice in person with the Eastern District U.S. Attorney's Office and DOJ Civil Rights Coordinator, who called into question the political nature of a recent letter from the police chief to the school district, which I, again, I gave my take to. And finally, last week, I had another eye-opening meeting in this regard that happened to me when I met with the Washington State Attorney General's office, who the AG's office raised the fact that they were receiving a large number of police misconduct reports from Spokane, which again, I gave my take. After having these conversations with these well-respected criminal justice officials in their field, who can quite clearly um, see as respected individuals in their field the deficiencies and misconduct of the Spokane Police Department. So I'm very baffled on how the Spokane city leaders have stalled any kind of true police reform that could fix this broken department. It's been 664 days since the city council proposed their 24 point public safety reform agenda yet to be voted on. Many of those items in the city's reform agenda haven't been resolved by Olympia and those very items could be immediately brought forward for a vote by the city council now. Reform agendas uh, such as whereas Black Lives Matter and must matter to all of us if we're going to realize the promise of freedom and liberty for us all, for all people in our community. Or how about the agenda items like prohibiting the bear hat usage or public input in the police contracts, hiring and diversity uh, 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 as well as implicit bias training, collaboration group on reimagining public safety, an independent city prosecutor position, or even publishing internal affairs investigations to the city's website. Those reform agendas must be passed now. If not now, when? No more blank checks for SPD until the city council passes true police accountability and reform. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anwar. And that is the last public forum testimony. It's been a fun-filled evening. Thank you all for your patience. And thank you, council president. Uh, we will meet again April 25th, that's next Monday, right here.
Have a great rest of your week. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>